Hi everybody, this is Leo Vallant. Here I'd like to do another video in my Creating an Idealized Persona series, where we talk about the persona ideals we read about in literature and which we see in the movies. Yeah, upon first sitting down to write this blog, I was ready to come out hard against the artificiality that we can find in so many books and movies. Yeah, a good story about artificiality in the arts comes to us via Raymond Chandler, 1888-1959, who created the private detective hero Philip Marlowe. Chandler explained that before the talky movies came out, which presented mobsters as seething with gratuitous violence and witty sarcasm, well, they were actually just sort of straightforward, hard-edged, and business-like. But after all those gangster movies of the 1930s sank into the popular consciousness, well, it became a matter of life-imitating art, and Chandler noticed that in the real world, all the mobsters were turning into wise guys. They had to fit into the Hollywood mold. Yeah, it made for great dramatic movies that were fun to watch, but it probably didn't make the world a nicer place to live in. So it's good that we, we begin on this note of caution, realizing that art can often present exaggerated, distorted, or even just plain false representations of the world. But then I remembered that both literature and media had both originated from out of the same primary art form, storytelling. So yeah, I searched up, when did humans first start telling stories? And I got this article about how cave paintings in southern France from 30,000 years ago seemed to tell stories in the form of pictures. Well... Pictures aren't words, and often drawings present inaccuracies, or for whatever reasons, they're not compelling presentations of what they're supposed to represent. But words are nominal generalizations and are intended to suggest to the reader or listener the ideal or archetypical sense of the word. So really, what that means is that I can draw a horse and end up with some ludicrous caricature, or I can say the word horse and people will come up with their own faithful images of what a horse should be. Oh, and this becomes a bit of a problem for book lovers who watch movies adapted from their favorite books because, well, the movies never look the same way as they've been imagined by the readers. Also, now that I think about it, when others are indifferent to the books that we love, well, we need to wonder if it was just a failure of their imagination, that they were not looking with their mind's eye at what the words were trying to show them. You know, there's a condition called aphantasia, which means a blind mind's eye. You know, if you tell somebody with aphantasia to imagine a red apple, well, they just get mental darkness. Often people with aphantasia, not knowing what they don't know, don't realize they have this deficit. Supposing talk about the mind's eye and even the term imagination is somehow to be taken metaphorically that they don't seem to miss what they never had. But yeah, such people would not be the greatest fans of literature. It takes one's own internal resources of imagination to put life into words. Also, I believe that primitive human thinking used to be in terms of visual imagery largely what we experience in dreaming. But as human language developed and our brains increased in size and our higher mental functions came more online, well, our thinking slowly became an internal dialogue, or monologue for people who never questioned their own opinions. 
I once actually saw how this works. Years ago when I was working on lucid dreaming, when I was trying not to wake up from a lucid dream. I, used, I was using the technique of greatly increasing my respiratory rate with short, rapid, deep breaths because I can usually increase the intensity of consciousness in a dream and extend duration by a bit. Well, it worked in a limited fashion by slowing down the rate at which I resurfaced into waking, but that gave me about four or five seconds of the kind of crossover state in which the visual scenery of the dream began to break down and be translated into a descriptive narrative using words instead of images. My conclusion from that is that dreaming is much like primitive pre-verbal thinking, but verbal thinking gives us both the generalizable words, but also would summon up the imagery that our words would suggest, being a kind of best of both worlds. But narrative storytelling seems to have started only three or four thousand years ago with the development of oral traditions which give us epic poems, sagas, creation stories, and mythologies. Yeah, it started out with itinerant storytellers telling their stories in exchange for food in a place by the fire. Well, most cultures have protocols in regards to itinerant beggars, and most peoples have decided that after one evening's hospitality, that would be time for the beggars to move on the next day. But the storytellers were able to beat this rule by finishing each night's story by claiming that the next evening's stories would be even better. So we have the Homeric epic stories from the Greek world, which go on and on forever, and we see such a we see much the same thing with the Vedic tales as well as with the Norse sagas. The Thousand and One Arabian Nights was written on exact on exactly that premise that a near endless progression of stories would just keep getting better and better. Also. I've read opinions that state that the Thousand and One Arabian Nights, while containing some apparently original stories, was likely a compendium of stories from out of the oral traditions from all of the civilizations that had ever been part of what became a cosmopolitan Western Asia. While well, epic stories and oral traditions, with their heroes and villains, Tell us much about what the perceived persona ideals were in these past times. Really, it was through my analysis of pre-1000 BC epic tales that I determined that humanity was then pre-moral, with social morality finally being worked into storylines starting about 1000 BC from an originating point within the Persian-speaking world. So yes, while I really would prefer to have numerous ideal role models walking around among us in real life, well, we're probably lucky that we can refer to literature and media for a large body of descriptive works that present idealized persona characteristics, which, as a kind of second best, we can all wish were true. Perhaps I tend to take reading so much for granted because I've done so much of it. Really, one of the problems I had at college was that I'd waste time reading non-assigned books, mostly 19th century English literature. No, academically I took a bare minimum of literature courses, seeing it as a very soft discipline where scholars would be expected to get into serious debates over what really comes down to matters of taste. But I still loved reading this stuff, and I found the world of 19th century literature far more morally elaborate and compelling than modern literature, 
where writers are warned by the modern arbiters of taste to not instruct, lecture, or preach to their readers, and to present characters as being natural and normal. But where can we find any ideals anywhere in a formula as bland and restricted as that? The best I've seen in the 20th century was, again, Raymond Chandler, who presented his Philip Marlowe as an idealized persona, a kind of a hungover knight in tarnished, tobacco-stained armor. So yeah, the 19th century was the golden age for English literature. It seemed as though the British were actively searching for ideals, and they wanted to be good. But at the same time, the social and moral codes were usually demanding, and so people's raw, impulsive desires often conflicted with their higher moral codes, and the stories wound around trying to resolve these conflicts. But now, with today, well, we have no social or moral codes, except for the prohibitions against rape and murder. And there are plenty of books about all that. But by abandoning most of the commonplace morality, well, we also eliminated a great many interesting conflicts, and so life has become flat. Yeah, maybe the 19th century had to contrive its own moral problems, but that took a lot of strength of character, and so it made them morally and intellectually stronger than what we see today. The best female idealized persona I've ever seen in literature was from Thomas Hardy's The Hand of Ethelberta. But yeah, let me introduce Thomas Hardy. Hardy had an odd writing career, being a second-rate writer for more than a decade and then suddenly jumping up at least one quantum state to write as Far From the Manning Crowd, an undisputed masterpiece, where the male protagonist, Gabriel Oak, does a fair job himself of being a male ideal persona. But with The Hand of Ethelberta, written just after he wrote Far From the Madden Crowd, Hardy creates an ideal female, but puts her in a middling starting position in life, and the reader gets to follow her as she climbs up her mountain of success, sacrificing even love in order to raise, raise up her entire family. I feel that it's Hardy's most underappreciated novel. Yeah, it was the last Hardy book I read, thinking it must have been terrible because I had never heard anything good about it. But then I found it to be great. And again, that's why I didn't major in literature. There's no accounting for tastes. There's a few other books I can mention. There is Middlemarch by George Eliot. George Eliot was a woman. It's a book that I've argued might be the finest novel in the English language. It has a number of characters with ideal character traits, but the plot puts everybody through a great many interesting bumps and scrapes. Oh, I found a colleague of Charles Dickens who was actually the far better writer of the two, Wilkie Collins. And in one of his best novels, The Woman in White, well, we have his young protagonist, Walter Hartwright, who is certainly ideal, but Collins also gives us the personification of fascinating evil with his Count Fosco. Then there is the amazingly interesting character of Miriam Holcomb, who I think was intended to suggest the personality of a butchy lesbian but without crossing any of the forbidden lines back then, and her character had been a huge hit with the reading public. Then the English language has this peculiar oddball book of absolute genius, Wuthering Heights, 
that had been written by Emily Bronte, a 22-year-old girl on her tuberculosis sickbed. It was her first and only novel. She died before she could write another. Her sister Charlotte would write another great novel, Jane Eyre, easily one of the best five novels ever written. But what Emily did with Wuthering Heights was she took powerful but raw characters and put them into a savagely dysfunctional home out in the middle of a barren English highland moor and somehow stretched basically the same main characters over two generations, in effect passing on the same personas to the children. Figuring that just one lifetime wasn't enough to fix all that was messed up about them. The closest we get to an idealized persona is Ellen Dean, the housekeeper, who follows through both who follows through both generations, becoming the North Star of normalcy amidst all the other wildly troubled characters. It's a book where order slowly bubbles up out of chaos. Emily Bronte uses about four unreliable narrators. Yes, yeah, search that up. To tell the story, and so you can only guess what really happened to all the characters. But if there is any agreement, it's that the Heathcliff character is willful, tempestuous, and often malevolent. But by the end of the book, he undergoes this strange and unexplained unexplained spiritual epiphany. Or maybe I just didn't understand it. And the next time I read Wuthering Heights, I'll get the epiphany myself. Yeah, maybe Wuthering Heights is the most reread book in the English language. But enough about literature. The big art form of the 20th century was cinema. So now if I had to suggest one movie that showcased idealized personas, it would be the 1957 movie An Affair to Remember with Cary Grant and Deborah Kerr. The Cary Grant character, Nicky Ferrante, is rich, multi-talented, charming, and intelligent, but in life he is just an aimless playboy. The Deborah Kerr character, Terry McKay is a beautiful, clever, and very engaging woman who could only be as good as she could be and still keep eating, considering she was born on the poor side of town, and say so she ended up being a kept woman after having made her living singing in nightclubs. They meet on a cruise ship transiting between Europe and New York, and sparks fly at first, but Terry McKay puts on the brakes for the sake of propriety. But the ship stops at a port on the French Riviera, and Nicky invites Terry to come along on a visit to see his grandmother. That visit to the grandmother is the pivotal scene in the movie. As soon as Terry sees the house and garden that sits atop a prominence that commands a view of the entire city and bay below, well, she is stunned by its tranquil but intoxicating beauty, suggesting a kind of a ascension to the heavenly, with the flowering garden being paradise. The grandmother is met as she comes out of the home's attached private chapel, and then Terry finding it too charming to resist, asks if she may go in. Of course the grandmother agrees, but then she takes only a moment to tell Nicky that a few prayers wouldn't kill him either. He goes into the chapel and sees Terry down on her knees, hands folded in prayer before a life-size statue of the Blessed Virgin. Well, in his eyes, this puts her into a whole new light. She bows her head so that the wide brim of her hat can hide the tears in her eyes, which Nicky notices as he gives her a brief side glance. And we know he is wondering what she could be crying about. Then he himself looks up at the Blessed Virgin. 
and bravely looks away, feeling his unworthiness. But he forces his eyes bravely back and allows his own feelings to happen. Then they both get up. They cross themselves and walk out. Their lives totally and forever changed. It's a really cool scene. Yeah, Warren Beatty updated this same screenplay with his 1994 love affair with Annette Benning playing Terry McKay. Terry McKay would have still been Irish Catholic, but Warren Beatty was uncomfortable with the Catholic theme, and so he replaced the Virgin Mary and the saintly grandmother with Catherine Hepburn in her final film role. Warren Beatty's Love Affair is a great movie too, but leave it to me to prefer the clearly spiritual theme of the earlier movie. But in both movies, Nikki and Terry, through their love, bring each other to persona idealization. So yeah, if our real lives are devoid of compelling role models, then books and movies might be able to fill in some of that gap. But a word of warning. Read a lot of books. Don't fixate on any single book. Don't obsess. It takes a lot of books and a lot of movies before one has enough educated intellectual capacity to allow for contextualizing any single one of them. Most of what we know can only be learned by making comparisons. Well, thank you, everybody. It's time we draw this to a close. Please, if, if any of you have your favorite books or movies that showcase idealized personas, well, let me know down in comments. Maybe I could squeeze a few short videos out of such a discussion. And there will be a part three in this series, but I don't know what it will be yet. It's I still got to think about it, but thinking about stuff is work too, and I better get on it. But yes, and thank you, everybody. It's how do you turn this thing off again?